Hey everybody, Robin from Backscatter here. Jim from Backscatter here. And we just got back from shooting the brand new, long-awaited Nikon Z8. Jim, my first question for you is, are you stoked on this thing? This thing is actually pretty cool, Robin. Um, we both shot it and uh, we had a blast doing it. Definitely a great camera. I've got a couple questions for you all about, you know, the image quality and what's going on with uh, the differences between this and some of the other Nikon mirrorless cameras that are out there. And, you know, we've kind of been waiting for this thing to come out since the, uh, the D850 started getting a little old. So we're going to compare it to that too and talk about some of the major video improvements this thing has. You ready to dive in? Let's do it. Jim, I guess our biggest question here is, the Z8, is it a mirrorless D850 or a mini Z9? Where does it fit? Well, Rob, it's actually kind of both of those things. Um, obviously, the Z9, much bigger camera. Right. Um, however, the only basic difference between these two cameras is the battery mm -hmm. um, and the size. If you cut the battery in half of the Z9, basically, you got a Z8 uh, just about. Um, the, the performance on the autofocus, actually a little bit improved. Um, you have the video specs, same. Shooting speed, far frames per second and stills, same. Um, so yeah, you're, they're, they're pretty comparable. So for an underwater shooter, it really comes down to, do you want bigger battery or the smaller size body? Okay. Now we talk about compared to DA50, I mean, there's a whole slew of upgrades from a DA50. Um, Obviously, the biggest difference that you see is the viewfinder, optical versus um, uh, electronic. Sure. So there is that, of course. Um, but you, like as I mentioned before, 20 frames per second raw, which is massive difference to the D850. Yeah. Um, the You still have 3D tracking. So if you had a D850 before, you'll be pleased to know it works in exactly the same way. Um, you'll be even more pleased to know that it works a lot better. Um, so the speed of the uh, acquisition, the speed of focus, the tracking, all that is you know, massively better over the D50. Not that the D850 was bad by any stretch. That was our favorite camera in the DSLR era of, um, of autofocus performance from both speed and tracking. What about other Nikon full-frame mirrorless cameras? Any comparison you got there? Yeah, so compared to like the, the Z7 series camera, for example, um, it's light years ahead of that. Um, I thought moving from the D850 when they had the first mirrorless come out with the Z7, I thought that was a pretty significant downgrade um, as far as coming from a D850 was concerned. Um, now, when you go from a D850 to a um, Z8, it's, it's a definite upgrade for sure. Nice. But uh, the Z7, I mean, it was, the body was um, a bit smaller. It was uh, maybe, it was lighter weight, more compact, which was, I guess, what they were going for. But the autofocus was a major step backwards. Um, image quality was, you know, about the same as the D850. Um, maybe a little bit of, uh, of a reduction in dynamic range over that. But uh, yeah, the Z8 is, is definitely um, heads and tails above the Z7 series cameras, the one and the two. Awesome. And speaking of image quality, how do you think this one fares against, I mean, the D850 has been a gold standard for us for so long. How does this one stack up to that, that top tier Nikon photo quality? Well, we didn't really have any complaints about image quality with the D850. Yeah. Um, and it's basically the same sensor. Um, so there isn't really much there isn't really much difference in image quality with the Z, um, Z8 versus the D850. So you're gonna get the same image quality. What does make it stand out? You know, I know when we were on the trip, a lot of what we were talking about was just the speed and responsiveness of this thing. So kind of go into the detail on that for me. Yeah, I think the one of the big themes with this camera is, is speed. Um, not just the speed of shooting the 20 frames per second raw, um, bottomless, essentially a bottomless buffer mm -hmm. just about, I think it's like a thousand images or something like that crazy um and uh the speed of acquisition of autofocus the speed of the tracking of the autofocus um but the other thing that's kind of interesting is that this camera does not have a traditional shutter like a mechanical shutter like you had in the past I know that you eliminated mirrors out of the mirrorless cameras obviously hence the name but uh, but they still had a mechanical shutter in there. Um, this one uh, gets rid of that completely. 
and now you have just a pure electronic shutter because the readout speed of the sensor is actually fast enough to capture an image without a mechanical shutter. So when you go to take a picture, uh, when you press the shutter, the lag is just non-existent. Mm. And we've been shooting cameras, mirrorless cameras in the last few years for all these reviews we've been doing. And some of the lower end cameras, like, you know, like a Sony um, A7 IV, which for its full frame is on the lower end of the side of things, still a great camera. But one of the things that was immediately noticeable was the lag that you have when you press the shutter button until the time it takes the picture. Now, I don't want to exaggerate this because, you know, we shoot so many different cameras. This has got to be one of the fastest shooting cameras. You press the shutter and, and like, it just takes the image. The other advantage of that is, um, is that there's no blackout in the viewfinder whatsoever, not one iota, because there's no mechanical shutter to interrupt the view from the sensor. There's got to be some caveat to having that lack of mechanical shutter, though. Where's that show up? Well, it shows up in the flash sync speed. Um, so the flash sync speed of the Z8, just like all the other uh, Nikon mirrorless cameras, uh, is only one over 200. And so uh, the D850, that one was one over 250, so you get an extra third stop there. Um, so that is that is kind of a, a, a drawback, I'd say, from uh, from that shutter. So let's dive a little deeper into the electronic viewfinder. Like you said, it's kind of one of the main differences between this and an SLR. Um, but as we discovered, there's some benefits to this electronic viewfinder too. It's not all about losing the optical viewfinder on the SLR. There's some stuff you can do with this that you couldn't with the D850. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, I would say after all these years now of transitioning from SLR to mirrorless, I do have a kind of a love-hate thing with the electronic viewfinder. You got wide angle and you got macro. Uh, on macro and electronic viewfinder, I love it. Um, you got the focus peaking in here now. Um, you don't have to take your face away from the, the viewfinder to review your images. It's absolutely fantastic for macro. You don't have to ruin the position of your camera, like the tiniest things in the ocean, to look at your screen to see if you got it. Dark, you know, position to, to look in the viewfinder, no ambient light creeping with it. Absolutely fantastic. Hands down, shoot. If you have for macro over optical viewfinder any day. And this one looks great. Though on the wide angle side of things, that's where, you know, mirrorless isn't as strong because um, the dynamic range. And so we've talked about dynamic range for wide angle shots with other viewfinders. I have to say that uh, where the Nikon stacks up, kind of in the middle, um, it's certainly not the best. And I think the, the reasoning is that Maybe because it's a lower resolution, I don't know. Um, I know Sony's have higher resolution, like in the uh, A1, A7R5, it's about almost three times the resolution. Um, and with those ones, I can see a sunball clearly. And that's really what comes into play when you have a very heavily backlit situation. It's like a sunball. Um, with this one, um, I couldn't really see the sunball that well in most situations. However, it does have something called uh, Shadow Boost. Uh, in the menu system, so you can boost shadows in the EVF. And I did that, and it did boost the shadows, but it unfortunately didn't do anything to make me see the sunball that much better. Um, so I still felt like the um, Sony high-end viewfinders uh, were um, better on the electronic side than the Nikon. That being said, even with the lower resolution of this one, it's only a little over 3 million dots as opposed to a little over 9 million dots. I didn't notice a difference in the resolution. It was um, very lifelike and uh, the detail on it was good. The refresh was good, felt very good looking through it. Um, didn't look like I was um, looking at a video game, which some of the other low end ones kind of makes me feel like. Um, this one I think did, uh, did pretty well otherwise. So I understand this viewfinder has a different magnification power than what we're kind of used to. Tell me about that. Yeah, this one has a 0.8x uh, magnification on it, which means it's going to be bigger as far as when you put the viewfinder up to your eye. Um, this is, to me, underwater, this is immediately noticeable. When I was using a 45 degree viewfinder, I was using the Nauticam viewfinder that had the 0.8 um, magnification as well. And so it was just huge nice. uh, when I was looking at it. You know, compared to other viewfinders, like a Sony has a 0.9, um, sounds pretty close. 
but this is noticeably bigger view. Let's crack into the autofocus. This has got 3D autofocus tracking we've come to know and love so much. Tell me about that. Yeah, so with the D850, anybody who's had one of those, or even D500 for that matter, or older, um, the 3D tracking autofocus works by placing the square for your focus uh, in your viewfinder directly over your subject. You hit the AF on button. If you're in continuous focus, you hold down, it'll lock onto that part of the subject and follow it as it moves through the frame or if the camera moves. Um, and it works so exceedingly well that, uh, especially with the D850, with all the improvements they have with AF, that it just never had an out of focus image. It was just done and done, especially with the higher resolution cameras, you know, you're over 40 megapixels. You really got to nail focus. And so having that really track and get it spot on is critical in high resolution cameras. So it did it great. So now when they moved to the Z7 series, for some whatever reason, they ditched that whole system for it. And it, uh, it was a lot harder for moving subjects, even for wide angles, normally wide angle 3D tracking It'll pick up and do well, even the older cameras. You probably might well notice that much of a difference between a Z8 and some of the older cameras, just because it's easy yeah. for a camera to pick up on on wide angle autofocus. There's gobs of depth of field with it, not a big deal. Where I think this thing really shines is on the macro side, which is, like I said before, either the worst or best autofocus test you could ever do for something. I mean, I'm locking on eyes of blennies and it's tracking it no problem. My little micro movements you have when you're doing macro underwater um, tracks it no problem. You slap a diopter on to go greater than one to one. As long as you're in the range of what the diopter can do, then it still snaps the focus just as if you didn't have a diopter on. It was pretty cool. Nice. Um, another benefit that I, that I really found useful was that when I do the focus uh, with a diopter on or even without a diopter if i drift out of the range of what the lens can do let's say i drift a little too close i'm closer than minimum focus distance which, which is easy to do yeah and it's if i'm if i was close before and i drift a little bit it, gets, it instantly gives me a red square telling me i'm out of range it doesn't just go hunt all over the place burr, burr, back and forth and you got to try and achieve that focus all over again which is a real pain um this would if you're just outside of it and you you bump it to one other side, it's giving instant red square to let you know you're out of range, which I thought was fantastic. Cause then I can just back up, you know, the couple millimeters that I went over, reacquire autofocus and then take the shot. Yeah, that's awesome. One other thing that we were talking about is that with this particular macro lens, the Z105, we can get up to F40. This also has like an ISO extension in it that gets it lower than 64. So you're able to knock out a lot of ambient light with this camera. Talk to me a little bit about that aspect of it. Yeah, so for macro shooting, I found this highly enjoyable to shoot because of the autofocus number one that we just talked about. Yeah. But secondly, because I can get the ambient light so dark. The best way you get good looking macro is by knocking all the ambient light out of your image. And sometimes that can be challenging. When we were at the digital shootout in Little Cayman this year, in June, in the Caribbean, in 40 feet of water at noon. On white sand. On white sand. <laughs> yeah. It's like the highest ambient light conditions you're going to come across. Right. And so you need to knock all that out if you're going to plan on snooting something. So what I did is I took a picture of this Pike Blenny, um, this example shot here, and I was able to get everything dark enough so that I could you know, get a black background, even when shooting in those really bright ambient light conditions. So this camera, um, and like the Z9 with it, um, and others as well from Nikon, I can get this down, like you said, down to ISO 32 in the extension. I can get it to 200 uh, on the sync speed, and I can get the lens up to F40. Um, and that will give me the darkest exposure out of just about anything else out there. If you compare that to like a Sony A1, um, I can I can only get it to be so dark. It'll be about a stop and a third brighter than this because it has a limitation on F22 on the macro lens and it can only go down to 50 ISO despite it having a 1-400 sync speed. So all those factors combined together make this one of the darkest ambient light cameras 
And with the macro fake focus capability of 3D tracking and how great this lens looks, um, I, this is a really great macro rig. One other thing people might say is like, oh, F40, you go up there, you're gonna get some serious amount of diffraction. Well, I used diffraction compensation in the menu. Um, and when I look at my images, they look pretty darn sharp. So it wasn't like um, uh, upset about that at all, or it, it had any concern, I guess, is probably the right word to say it. Um, the other thing people might say, oh, you're going to extension for ISO. Well, that's gonna kill your image quality. I've been shooting into extension going low for macro for quite some time to try and control ambient light on a slew of different cameras. And we just don't have a lot of dynamic range in macro. Yeah. Not, not like a wide angle shot. So right. I've never seen any kind of image quality hit from that. So pretty happy with that. Hey everybody, hope you're enjoying this video. You know, you can join our family by buying your underwater photo and video gear from us here at Backscatter. Every purchase includes free lifetime tech support, will beat any price hands down, and we ship worldwide daily. Our in-house authorized warranty service center has you covered for any maintenance and repairs. Here at Backscatter, we dive, shoot, and service everything we sell. Whether you're point and shoot or professional, we look forward to helping you meet your underwater imaging goals. Now back to the video. So the Z8 brings some serious video capabilities to the table. You know, it's pretty much similar to what the Z9 can do, but if we're talking about coming up from a D850 to this, it's like a whole nother world. So let's dive into that. This thing can do 8K60 raw video. That seems insane. Yeah, this is a like a holy crap difference <laughs> between yeah. D850 and Z8. Well, it's the same thing as a Z9, right? You're getting the same specs as that. Um, but in a smaller package. So like you said, AK60 in Nikon RAW, um, also known as NRAW, um, you do 4K 120, albeit a little bit of a crop, 4K 60 that is downsampled from the 8K 60. Uh, so that'll be some super crazy sharp um, imagery from that. Plethora of options for you on this. It's it's probably the best spec video camera alongside the Z9 that's out there right now. Um, you'd have to go to like a, a Canon uh, R5 Cinema, the R5C camera to get these kind of specs. Um, but it. along with those specs, there's kind of some drawbacks too we gotta address. Yeah, there's some drawbacks. So a um, couple things are um, with this in particular is that um, you only have uh, one large card slot mm -hmm. for a uh, CF Express Type B. So um, if you're shooting 8K60 in NRAW, it will chew through the card pretty quick. You're going to need um, multiple big cards on hand for that if you're doing that. Um, second kind of caveat, again, with talking about doing uh, the high spec, high res video is um, is heat buildup. Uh, we did experience that. Um, when the camera is inside a housing, it did uh, heat up uh, quite quickly for us. Um, it didn't cause any issues with, um, I'd say like operation. I would get a hot card icon on the screen. Um, sometimes after as little as two minutes of shooting, uh, keeping in mind that I'm in the Caribbean in June in hot conditions inside a black aluminum housing, although it was still on a uh, covered boat while we were going out. Um, it did get warm. And Hotter than it is here in Monterey. Yeah, for sure. With that, I, I was just spending, there was one dive in particular where I was shooting a lot of video on it and I did chew through the battery in one dive. So I did have to replace it. Uh, so if you're shooting video quite a bit with this, I would say definitely uh, bring extra batteries on the boat. Um, when I opened up the housing, I felt a waft of heat come out. But that being said is that the camera never shut down. It just gave me high heat warnings. Yeah, it's more of a disclaimer, it seems. It didn't actually shut us out of any clips, so that was great. There's a setting in the menu that allows you to um, choose a higher temperature for the warning to come on uh, and let it operate more like that. So I, I put that on and uh, it does come with warning in there. It says, ah, it may reduce image quality. And that's usually because the sensor is getting hotter 
Um, and typically that introduces maybe a little bit more noise. I didn't see anything like that in my images. Let's talk about the ambient light white balance. We always say if the color ain't right, nothing else matters. So we got some crazy specs here, but how did it actually do at depth? Yeah, well, that's the kind of the disappointing side is that it's not any different from the Z9 or any of the previous Nikon cameras. Um, you know, it, it'll white balance down to about 40-ish feet or so, maybe 45. It just will not take when you hit around 50. It'll just say, can't, 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 and just refuse to take a white balance. Um, so your last one is probably gonna be around 40 feet and you gotta carry that all the way deeper. So that being said, if you're shooting in like a MP4 kind of format, um, you're kind of hosed if you're, if you're trying to shoot below 40 feet. Um, up to 40 feet, look pretty good. Um, not bad at all. Uh, it's, I'd certainly um, be happy with the video that came out of that, the color that is. Um, if you're shooting NRAW, then you can go deeper and then correct it later because you have the latitude and post to do it. It's easier to uh, correct something that's been uh, balanced a bit shallower and then when you take the camera deeper rather than the other way around, you know, and adding more red into it is easier than taking out the kind of like the purple water, which is what happens with this. If you balance it, you know, around 45 feet or so, the water starts to turn purple. You'll require an NRAW workflow if you're going to do that ambient white light balance at depth, um, uh, you know, getting past like 40, 50, 60 feet. But with our experience that we've done with it, we're able to correct it in post. But you have to ask yourself a question, is that something you really want to do? Do you want to deal with raw files, color grading, that kind of stuff? If that's your game and you love it, all means go ahead. But if that you're like, no, I just want it right out of the camera, you're going to have to look at something else um, for color wise. Um, however, if you're using lights, you're good to go. Uh, it's, it, it'll look great with lights. It's not going to pose an issue. It's just if you're doing the ambient light only white balance. So on previous Nikon cameras, we've had to point out that there is no meter on screen in video mode. So judging your exposure is kind of a workaround process. What's that like? Yeah, well, unfortunately Z8 doesn't have meter for video either. So the workarounds that I do for video on the Nikon cameras is I shoot a manual, number one. Uh, number two is when I shoot shutter speed, that's gonna be double my frame rate. So if I'm 4K 60, then I'm gonna be shooting 1 1 25th of a second. Aperture for wide angles, usually between eight and 11 on that. So that stays set. Then what I'll do is I'll do auto ISO. Um, and then I'll do negative 0.7 exposure compensation on the, uh, on the dial for that. The reasoning I do negative 0.7 or two thirds of a stop underexposed is that if you shoot dead on the meter, uh, HD TVs, 4K TVs, they tend to uh, over contrast and over sharpen, over sharpen things. So it's um, everything looks kind of washed out uh, if you shoot straight on the meter. So by going to negative 0.7, you have better color saturation. Uh, when you take exposure down, colors get saturated and uh, it'll help with that. Uh, uh, dealing with the 4K and HDTVs. So that's what I always shoot for video. So it's a workaround. And if you're doing a scene where you want to do a pan from like bottom to top or top to bottom, where you don't want it to auto um, correct for the exposure, you can hit the AEL button for auto exposure lock while you're doing that and be able to knock that out. One of the other major things we gain on top of the already significant list of video improvements is image stabilization. So what's the deal there? Well, mirrorless cameras don't have a mirror box, so the sensors can be stabilized uh, with motors and stuff. So this one will go up to six stops of uh, image stabilization. And it's good for photo as well. If you're doing some handheld stuff uh, on land, some insects or macro stuff, bugs, something like that, it'll work for that as well. So now that we're actually ready to get this thing into the water, what are our options here? We got Icolite, we got Nauticam on the table in front of us, but what else can we expect for the Z8 underwater? Well, I, I just want to reiterate, Icolite and Nauticam were what's available right now. Mm. So um, we're at the very early stages of the Nikon Z8 being out as a camera and also the housing. And we just got this housing in this week from Icolite. <laughs> Thanks for setting that out. So let's, 
Um, and, uh, you know, Nauticam's uh, been out for maybe like a week or so longer than that. But anybody who's anybody is going to make a housing for this camera. This is going to be one of the most popular cameras out there. So whatever housing brand that you have out there, um, whatever you're a fan of, there will be a housing for this, no doubt. So let's recap here. What are the key elements that make the Z8 so cool? Well, there's a whole slew of them. Uh, number one, um, you've got the speed of the autofocus and the return of 3D tracking. Two, a Nikon mirrorless body that is not a full-size body. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's light years ahead of what we were seeing before in, in the D850. Not that that was ever by, bad by any stretch of the imagination. Right. So we get the autofocus. The image quality is the same great image quality. If any broke, why fix it? Colors look fantastic. Sharpness, detail, all there looks great. As far as the big headline thing, just overall, I think it's speed. Um, now 20 frames per second raw, that's pretty insane if you think about it. There's a number of shots that I did SLRs where I was doing five, seven frames a second that I couldn't pull off the in-between shots. Now you can do that with these shots with this camera, especially if you're doing this double duty sports top side or birding top side. This has your back on the speed of it. Then the speed also um, relates to the shutter because there's no mechanical shutter anymore. When you press the shutter release button, it's like, I mean, that's even too slow. <laughs> it's so fast and there's no blackout in the viewfinder. So anything that you're looking at shooting fast, there's, it, it's just always there. And you have to see it to believe it. It's kind of one of those things, unless you use it, you don't really realize what you've been missing mm -hmm. with that side of it. Um, so those are kind of like the main points, I think, of like what's great about this thing. A couple of drawbacks, um, not the deal killers to me by any stretch um, on the video side. You know, no meter in video and uh, the ambient light white balance isn't very good past 40 ish feet or so. So if you're a serious video shooter, you're looking primarily as, as a video camera, this, this probably isn't going to cut it for you unless you're using lights all the time. Mm -hmm. And then the other uh, downside is because of the electronic shutter now um, and the readout speeds, they reduce the sync speed to one over 200, which you think is a bit of a issue for wide angle photography, especially if you come from a D850, you're used to one two fifty of the second, you have one third stop less. Um, that being said, all the Nikon mirrorless cameras are at one two hundred now. Almost all of the Canon cameras are now at one over two hundred. It's just that Sony is at two fifty on some of their full frame cameras, and the A1 is now at one four hundred, which is the gold standard for sync speed. So. Um, if you're evaluating your choices of things, you might want to take that into consideration as well, because you will be able to get more light from your strobes onto your uh, subjects um, with the with a sync speed. Okay, so quite a few pros, but also a couple of cons tucked in there. So with that knowledge in mind, who as underwater photographers need to be the most excited about this camera? Like, who's it really for? Well, if you've been holding onto your D850 for quite a long time, because you know, to be honest with you, it's been quite a long time since there's been any upgrade path from a D850 to something that was not a downgrade like the Z7 series, I, I believe, uh, from D850. Or, it's, uh, or like a jump up to the body of the Z9. Exactly, you know? yeah. So it's um, this is kind of you know a really nice upgrade for a D850 user. Um, I, I wouldn't hesitate to uh, recommend this to somebody who's come from a D850. Uh, someone else, I think the macro capabilities of this are fantastic. Getting the really dark ambient light to knock that out, even in bright situations, um, the higher up stops that you're able to get with Z105 lens, great, fantastic. And then just anybody who's generally interested in photography. Um, I, I think this is the image quality right out the gate with this is fantastic. I think if, like I said before, if you're a video shooter, Maybe this isn't the, the right camera for you, but if you're a stills photographer, this is this is all the classic Nikon image quality menu system control set that you're always used to, which I think is probably the best control set out there is from Nikon, then you'll feel right at home on this. Given that, do you think this is the final like death rattle of the SLR or where are we at? For Nikon, I definitely think so. Um, you know, I don't have a magic ball or a crystal ball or something to look at these things and 
Sometimes a lot of people in Nikon aren't even sure of it, but you look at the writing on the wall, um, if you're holding out hope that there'll be another DSLR, I don't know, man, it's, uh, there's like four lenses you'd want to use underwater basically for any camera system, you know, full frame. Generally an eight to 15 fisheye style lens, 1635 wide angle zoom type lens, uh, 60 macro and 105 macro. Out of all those for Nikon F mount, three of those four lenses are now discontinued. Mm. And those are some really popular lenses, not just for underwater, but also topside. Um, so if they're killing those lenses off for F mount, what's gonna happen to the cameras? I, I think that if you're waiting to um, make the jump to mirrorless because you're in hope there's another SLR coming out. I don't think it's ever going to happen. Not with Nikon. Maybe some retro thing 20 years from now or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is this is the next step um, from DSLR at this point. Jim, thanks for that detailed breakdown of this thing. It was a lot of fun to shoot this camera with you. It's cool watching you work your camera master magic on this thing. And you brought back some sick shots too. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to shoot. Uh, I didn't get as much time on it as I wanted to. Uh, certainly want to shoot it some more in the future. For sure. If you want to learn anything else about the Z8, we're just a phone call away here at Backscatter. You can help us make more of these videos by buying your gear from us too. Remember, we dive, shoot, and service. Everything we sell, every sale comes with free lifetime tech support, and we ship internationally every day. I'm Robin from Backscatter, signing off. I'm Jim from Backscatter signing off. And we'll catch you on the next one.